How do you determine the value of your time? Now, this is contingent on you being the type of person who lacks the transcendent inner peace necessary to DNF stuff. But mm, let's say you finish a book or a show or a movie or whatever, and it McHeckin sucked. You just spent many hours of your life engaging with this piece of media only for it to be awful. It wasn't even the fun kind of awful where you can laugh at the thing. No, it was the type that warranted sneers, jeers, and full-on I-can-see-my-brain level of eye rolls. Remember, you think dropping things is weakness and you are beholden to the sunk cost fallacy. How do you give value to hours that could have been better spent staring blankly at a wall while your brain melts in an all-encompassing unproductive guilt? You know, like my regular Tuesday. Well, as I sit here enveloped by the seasonal ennui and a conveniently placed wall, I present an obvious answer. Complain about it to anybody who will listen. I believe that all variety of garbage and trash, yes, there is a difference between the two, is invariably enhanced just by holding a buddy hostage and being all, bro, you gotta listen to this whack ass shit I just sat through. What, did you fashion me as one of those charming nerds who present a thesis and back it up with well-researched sources? No, 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 this is all about me. How I have read one book in a romance series and grimaced at its hollow inanity, yet simultaneously found one glimmer of interest, a sparkle of fun to its potential dumb trash, an unabashed goofiness that would make me go, huh, maybe the next one will get better. Not once, twice, but four times. What's worse that it did get better? Just enough to convince me to finish the series, but then it shot itself and me with an elephant tranquilizer like a couple of times. It reduced its level of quality to be lower than what it started out with. There was no longer any fun mixed within the dumb, no trashy treasures, but soppy garbage. I came here for dark mafia romance. What I got was a bunch of fluffy renditions of conventional genre tropes wearing a trench coat and holding a handgun that it totally knows how to use, you guys. No, no, seriously, it could show us right now. Just so we're clear, these type of niche churn out and toss into the Kindle Unlimited wild are not meant to be read critically. I'm well aware this is intended to be pulpy genre fun. I know, I know. It doesn't stop me from complaining about it, but I know. I had the bar set so subterranean, Satan would have struggled to limbo underneath it. I was having fun, until I wasn't. This is entirely a me problem. That's yours now as well. You see, this video is about me making my mentally unhealthy choices everyone else's problem. My effort to validate time I lost to forge trash out of garbage. You're welcome. For starters, if you're not familiar with the romance genre, it's commonplace for a series to follow individual stories of people within a group, not just a singular pairing. In this case, you have these five tall, dark-haired, bulky, brick shithouse dude bros who are each the head of their respective country's mafia. They are all allied together as a BFF ride-or-die group chat that they have dubbed The Priesthood. And like, I appreciate the attempt at a badass aesthetic, but if your grown asses aren't willing to fully embrace peak cringe as friends, like, what are you even doing, dude? Right from the get-go, the premise behind this gaggle of dorks is the silliest thing in the entire series. <laughs> they are dorky f**k boys and we're going to go along with it. The ages of these ultra ass-kicking, dick-slinging alphas range from can legally rent a car in the United States to I was in pre-algebra class on 9-11, yet they are referred to as head of insert region here mafia, like all the time. It's like, hey, Dark haired, ripped brick shit house number four. Are you sure you want to do this thing? You are head of the Italian mafia after all. Or dark haired, bulky brick shit house number three will be all like, I'm head of the Turkish mafia. It's my responsibility to handle such and such. And you know, like, I can't leave out dark haired tone brick shit house number fives. You dare pick a fight with me? I'm head of the Russian mafia. Hardy har har har. Hell, Dark haired, muscly brick shithouse number one is head of the Greek mafia, which apparently is not how they even refer to themselves. I think it was only corrected in future installments because one of the most liked reviews on Goodreads calls out how hilariously inaccurate a blanket Greek mafia is. Same with the Russian mafia, it's eventually corrected to Bratva. But you know, I'm gonna adhere to the original error in honor of the author's I don't give a f conviction. She sticks to her goofiness 
and it's admirable, and I will respect that. While these dorky spiritual quintuplets may indeed look like they could be half-brothers, they also have the personalities and depth of a 90s boy band. We have the Sundere bratty type, the chill Irishman type, the stern family man type, the smooth big brother type, and the playful lunatic type. Despite these distinctions, some of them are nigh interchangeable. The heroines aren't that different. They're vessels for reader insertion wearing the veneer of strong, independent female girl, who in actuality slide between pseudo-spunkiness and meek passivity as though those traits were different sides of a tennis court during Wimbledon. Their spines would solidify or gelatinate on a whim. They aren't wholly bad characters, but are ultimately unremarkable on their own, especially compared to their respective silly edgelord boy band love interests. Oh, oh, I almost forgot the creme de la creme. These heads of the mafia are all situated in North America. <laughs> Why you ask? I can only assume these big bad leaders of their entire nation's crime syndicate all had to flee their home nation so they could commit their unregulated crimes in the land of the free. God bless. So, bros, homies, dudesicles, <laughs> y'all gotta listen to this whack ass shit I just sat through. This is Michelle Hurd's Sinner series. And goddamn, look at those sleek ass covers. This is probably what drew me in in the first place now that I think back on it. This is just a testament to how we do, in fact, judge book by covers. <laughs> okay. Book one stars dark hair ripped brick shit house number one. Ah, okay. This joke is getting old. I'll refer to the men as priest number whatever from now on. I don't think YouTube will appreciate me saying shit house well over 50 times in this video. And you know, if these dorks won't lean into their group chat aesthetic, then I will try to. Anyway, priest one. Ah, no, no. See, that doesn't really roll up the tongue well either. Um, father one? No, no, that's too formal. Daddy one? <laughs> yeah, okay, these goobers f wish. Uber? Yeah, yeah, goober works. Okay, sure. So, goober one is head of the Greek mafia, and his father, the previous head of the Greek mafia, is engaged to Heron One's mother, a widow within this Mafia family clan. So Heroin One grew up within that environment. Because of this, she's aware that her single status is on borrowed time. Archaic, gotta wed the women off for them alliances trope and what have you. Heroin One's bound to be wedded off to some Mafia dude within their circle and she's biting her nails to the cuticle over it. A bit of characterization. Our girl's got severe anxiety issues that have stemmed from years of being bullied by her cousin over her plus size. Something her flighty mother doesn't believe happened because that cousin is such a kind girl who doesn't know the definition of torment. We all know the type. Her one's just compelled to pop her anti-anxiety meds like it's candy anytime she feels a panic attack. Which is almost every chapter in the first half. Given Heroin One's situation, it makes sense that she's a type who just wants to be left alone to finish her film school studies and then be on her merry way. The beginning of the pairing's dynamic is summed up to be all, you need to respect me, I'm head of this Greek mafia family that you're a part of. And she's like, leave me alone and I'll leave you alone, please, I'm begging you. Of course, he adheres to her wants in his own special head of the Greek mafia way, being all, Oh no, my stepsister is a distraction I need to be rid of. I know, I'll marry her off to some guy and that'll get her away from me. And that's what he tries to do. All the while, Heron One is just pulled along for the ride, being all, No, stop, you can't control me or my finances! And everyone around her is all like, Yes, we can, that's mafia life, baby! Even her mom's like, This is in your best interest, darling. Now please stop forging discord on this, the week of my new married bliss. Oh hon, you're such a Debbie Downer, and now you're getting upset. Look, look, here, here, here's your meds, pets. Now you're feeling better. Goober One battles his growing insta-lust for his stepsister as he plans her wedding. This is all within the first quarter of the book, by the way. It all comes to head on the big day, when a resigned Heron One stands at the altar, ready to sign herself away to an assigned husband who, while a good man, is not her choice. She gave resistance her best effort, which is to say, no effort. 
Them's the pits, you know. But right then, in between vows, the current groom, some guy, is tacked out, and Goober One slides into place all slick and smooth to marry his stepsister, whom he only met and insta-loved like two weeks ago. And no one bats an eye. That's right, our hunky lad went up and changed his mind just cuz. Heron One is stunned into autopilot mode and signs that marriage certificate anyway. The parents are in the pews, all smiles and tears. Their convenient life with Derek fantasies have manifested and they couldn't be happier. Angst or miscellaneous internal turmoil? Never heard of her. Goober One faces absolutely no hurdles in marrying his stepsister. Because in case y'all have forgotten, he's head of the Greek Mafia and everyone in the Greek Mafia adheres to the Ron Swanson principle. Heron One promises she'll make her new husband's life hell. And, you know, he saunters up real close to her and whispers, Bet. Those three letters reverberate within Heron One's very essence. And she folds immediately into her little wife role. Goober One treats his new stepsister wife as his blushing girl boss queen. Through the magical healing power of Gooby One's dick and her now elevated status, Heron One has a confidence and self-esteem boost to the point where she doesn't even need her pills anymore. Anxiety cured. While her intricately thorough character arc is going on, Goober One has his own subplot. A family of evil Sicilian mobsters are interfering with his business, and there have been casualties on both sides. It's all cheeky fun and deathly games between the Greeks and the Sicilians until the Sicilians have Goober One and Heron One's parents killed. So now it's personal. So like, Heron One gets no emotional closure with her like flighty, possibly emotionally abusive mother. She just dies just cuz. Goober One has been hunting down these evil Sicilians all book with the help of ace surveillance hacker and head of the Russian mafia, Goober 5. And my god, do we see this guy fulfill his single role quite a bit through this entire series. Goober 5 finally locates the evil Sicilian's base in Toronto. So Goober 1's like, assemble the rest of the squad. We're gonna roll up on them with a surprise attack and take them all out. Quick in and out trip, bada bing, bada boom. We can get it done in like a day or two. No big deal, baby, that's how we roll. They're in Vancouver, by the way. <laughs> yeah, so the priestly quintuplet boys assemble, gear up, and launch their goofy little cross-country surprise attack. The Sicilians truly never see those lads coming. There's a climactic shootout where Goober 1 exacts his revenge on the Sicilians, and Goober 5 lust at first sights the Sicilian family head's granddaughter, and he takes her as a participation trophy. This little element will be teased in books two, three, and four to his installment, and yeah, we'll get there. But wait, you know what? No, no, I want to flash back to Heron One and her character arc speed run because there's this beautifully silly as shit plot point that cannot go unmentioned. Okay, so during some party or whatever, the cousin who terrorized Heron One confronts her in the bathroom and beats the shit out of her. Goober One has none of this, as that's an affront to him and his queen. So he has the cousin strung up for days while he takes care of his bizarre Toronto adventure. And then when he returns, he lets Heron One have her final say, which amounts to, you may have tormented me for years, but who's on top now, neener, neener, neener. And Goober One shoots the bully in the head and that's that. Then he and Heron One live happily ever after. Cut to an epilogue some years later where Heron One has a couple kids already or something, and she's at the Academy Awards where she wins an Oscar through totally legit means and no corruption here at all, and, and everyone cheered! <laughs> so, book two is more grounded than the last one, which is probably why I liked it more when I first read it. But that also means there's less of it to recall. It focuses on the chillest man of the bunch, Irishman Goober 2. His story starts with him asserting his towering dominance over his bratty younger half-brother or stepbrother? I don't remember. This brother demands a more prestigious role within their legit company to prove his worth toward the family. But Goobs 2 sees through this slimy assertions and tells him to be thankful for what his incompetent ass has and f*** off. 
Meanwhile, heroine two is your run-of-the-mill nice girl who's desperate to land a job that'll pay for her ailing dad's nursing care. Luckily, she lands a temporary secretarial position at Gooby 2's legal construction company as a front desk girl. And she's excited. But her father's like, no, 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 you got to decline that offer. Quit that position. You cannot work for that company. See, it turns out her father's a member of the Irish Mafia, just some mid-level grunt. And he hid his daughter's existence, one that came from a one-night stand, from the group because he doesn't want her entangled in that life. But he did what he could to financially and emotionally support heroin too from afar. Effort was made and like, damn it, I'm a sucker for a loving girl dad, okay? However, Heroin 2 brushes off her dad's demand and accepts the temp job anyway. She'll just keep it a secret from her dad. She won't even be there for that long anyway, so like, where's the harm? What could possibly go wrong? But, oh no. All it takes is one meet cute, show Joey eye contact first encounter, and her fate in this book as a little mafia wife is f***ing sealed. Due to totally coincidental circumstances, Heroin 2 is now Goober 2's half-step brother's assistant. She went from front desk to CEO floor. But now she's only a door away from Gooby 2, so they can easily build their bond at a nice and steady pace. Head of the Irish Mafia is an all-around pleasant guy who honors the boundaries of his co-worker, for he has been baptized by the holy respects women waters in his youth. It's a Goldilocks amount of doe-eyed soft oo that's absolutely tantamount to this dark romance genre. Mm-hmm. Then we pass the halfway point and shit. Um, according to romance novel conventions, they're behind schedule. I, I guess we gotta set the pace to a jaunty jog now. Okay, let's see. Um, what's an easy way to give the dos pairing a development boost? I mean, we're in the workplace mic office setting. I guess that's still supposedly operating within the dark subgenre. So, um, let's go with half step brother tries to own Goober Two by assaulting Heroin Two. Yeah, that's what we'll do. She's rescued, of course, but she doesn't go entirely unscathed. Goober Two's racked with guilt, all like, Thousand apologies, honorable co-worker. Please allow me to grant you protection from my pathetic brother. It's only right that I take responsibility and shelter you at my place. I'll take no objections at this time. Let's go! And she's swept away. But surprisingly, Goob's Dos maintains his restraint. Don't get me wrong, man's got horn dog levels of desire he's shoving away deep inside. But he's committed to taking it slow. There's a thing where he doesn't like being touched, but then she accidentally touches him and he's all like, Duh, oh, lordy, her fingers have been blessed by the angels. I hope she holds my hand one day. Ooh woo. The build is steady and everything's Gucci. Until he finds out about her lineage. Through an incident I can only classify as a big old oopsie doodle. One day, Goober 2's buddy shoots the shit with Heroin 2's dad who's been helping uh, Goober 2 on the side find some, the, the, the bad guy of the book, so to speak. And this buddy casually slips what happened to Heroin 2. And the stress of it gives him a heart attack that straight up kills him. Heroin 2 survives an assault only to lose her dad in a way that worn a wah, wah, wah track. Like, Jesus. Just these meaningless parental deaths I cannot hear. So now, Sir Irish Cream Baileys knows that Heroin 2's technically a mafia princess. And because she's no longer an outsider to his world, it's fully justifiable for his chill demeanor to do a whack as 180. The inner horn dog Kool Aid bans themselves out of the abyss, where now Goober 2 must claim Heroin 2 for himself, as that is the right of any head of the mafia. Don't get me wrong, he still respects Heroin 2's boundaries as to not push her away, but he certainly exudes a kind of desperate, I'm um, like, I am terminally ill and if we don't do the sex right now, I will literally die, the energy. And it works, cause Heroin 2's an adorably sweet 2x4 doormat. I swear, this installment's an insult to the Irish. It's kind of sad, but funny. <laughs> And if you couldn't tell, this is the moment the train has blasted off the rails into Cuckoo Bananaville. But like I said, we've passed the halfway point without them cementing the relationship. A lot of these Kindle Unlimited romance books are 
typically on average a little less than 300 pages. And we gotta get these two in bed after they confess their everlasting love somehow. So it is time to bang. Oh, oh yeah, that conflict with the step half brother or whatever. Oh, balls. Um, like we're running out of pages, so let's just bring the rest of this book on home. Gooby 2 and Heroin 2 are lured into a trap involving panties drenched in bodily fluids. A few of the boys are flown in to lend a hand. We have a shooty shooty bang bang hoedown and then wrap it up with a heartfelt funeral for Heroin 2's dad where she gives a lovely eulogy. These two get engaged after a week and live happily ever after. Yay! Book 3 stars the head of the Turkish Mafia. After book two, I have more or less accepted this series is the equivalent of Bubbles going hardcore. I mean, I'd prefer if the rest of the series embraced the absurdity like book one, but fine, I'll take the turn to the silly sweetness for what it is. This will later turn out to be a lie made in sweet denial though. So we have Heroin 3, a maid for an evil Polish mobster man. Oh jeez, we're just throwing darts at a map at Europe to pull these adversaries, aren't we? Okay, so like this guy is so evil that he has a box of bullets that each have the names of his staff carved into them. And then he'd use those bullets on their respective staff member for arbitrary reasons. When he's not feeling murdery, he settles with whipping the crap out of his staff. One day, this metal devil incarnate <laughs> orders Heroin 3 to go pick up his takeout dinner. But when she does, she bumps into Goober 3 and spills the food everywhere. He's all like, Watch where you're going, you dummy, grrr. Heroin 3, the keep your head down kind of person, magically materializes a spine and a good old set of vocal cords. And she scolds Gooper 3 for being a rude ass, that he was the one to bump into her, and people would usually apologize for that. You doofus. He's too privileged for this sass, so he throws some money at her for a new meal and continues on his merry way. I note this meet cute because it is the only time in the whole book where Heroin 3 like really speaks up for herself in a way that foregoes any sense of timidity. After this moment, her spine melts away, her vocal cords just go poop, and her character journey involves sculpting a new one entirely. Later that evening, evil Polish mobster man's whipping Heroin 3's back as punishment for being late with his dinner. But he's interrupted by his assistant about an incoming raid by Gubertres and his Turkish gang. You see, his parents were killed by evil Polish mobster man, and he sought vengeance since he was a kid. But evil Polish mobster man pieces out, leaving Heroin 3 lying on the floor with a f***ed up back. She eventually comes to and then tries to book it amidst the chaos. Heroin 3 doesn't make it out though, as she encounters Goober 3. He tries to question her, but she remains silent, fearing for her life. This proves to be a fruitless effort, cause he shoots her anyway. Okay, this is future editor me reporting in. I wanted to go back and check because this just didn't feel right. Given this author's track record with the past two books, I started to doubt that uh, Goopster 3 really did shoot Heroin 3 on purpose. And so I went back and checked and lo and behold, he was shooting uh, evil mobster man's goons that were scattered about and Heroin 3 just happened to jump into the line of fire, accidentally getting shot by him. Yeah. Either way, he shoots Heroin 3 and is immediately racked with guilt. Can't have her dying on me though, otherwise I won't be able to face the parents I'm trying to avenge in heaven. Guess I gotta take her with us. She's gotta have intel on the evil Polish mobster man anyway. From there, the rest of the book is a decent story about recovering from trauma and abuse from a cartoonishly evil work environment. Gooper 3 helps nurse Heroin 3 back to health. In turn, she works as a maid in his home because she was bored as hell just sitting on her ass. The other housekeeper quickly takes to Heroin 3 and becomes her mother figure. Gooper 3's grandmother joins the fold too. Our girl acquires a full support system and like, good for her. Meanwhile, Gooper 3 warms up to Heroin 3 and doesn't have any whack ass 180s into instant horn dog mode. Gooper 3 also has a weird ass fascination with how innocent and submissive Heroin 3 seems. She's been a part of evil Polish mobster man's household for all 22 years of her life, so yeah, she's naive as hell. Gooby 3 even confronts her one evening and pretty much has the talk with her. He even goes so far as to be all, I know what I want from you, dot dot dot, your virginity. <laughs> it's the perfect amount of awkward. I mean, all five Gooby Goobs ponder the level of their women's sexual activity, but 
you know, like, go figure, it's Scooby-3 who has a distinct focus on it. And that his woman's the most innocent, delicate flower type. The only modicum of saving grace is that his approach is so cringe, one would think he's never touched a woman before. Even though he's a rough and tough mobster guy, he knows where the meek homely heroine 3 has some character development and that culminates to a heroic badass moment that actually feels earned. See, evil Polish mobster man has been trying to get heroine 3 back, and there's this red herring that he might actually be her father, as she thinks that might be why he's never capped her with her personalized bullet. But that turns out to not be the case. Heroin 3 also has a subplot regarding her mom, who's been missing for some long ass time, presumably dead. But it turns out she's been trafficked by evil Polish mobster man to some eviler Polish mobster man. That guy has made Heroin 3's mama his favorite pet, and he's called dibs on Heroin 3 when he she grows bored of the mother and wants to break in a newer innocent toy. See, we don't exactly have the page count necessary to allocate for complex familial drama, so we gotta settle for evil guy needing to submit to an eviler guy. Got it, okay. Of course, Goop 3's gotta call in some of the bros to help him enact his vengeance once and for all, as well as have some cheeky banter with the boys. I swear, all these guys have better chemistry with each other than they do with their women. <laughs> it's kind of sad. But Gooster 3's revenge isn't quite as bombastic as one might expect it to be. It's actually rather anticlimactic. When Goopster 3 has evil Polish mobster man at his mercy, he's all, this is for my parents. And evil Polish mobster man's like, I have no idea who you are. And Gooby Goo Chua is like, do you remember some Turkish immigrants who owned a bakery some decades ago? Innocent people who tried to forge a better future for their family. And the guy's like, no. So Cooper 3 is like, oh, um, well then, bang. My revenge is complete and everyone cheered. In conclusion, Heroin 3's mom is saved and is on her own path toward recovery. The Tris pair live happily ever after. Okay, look, this is the best book solely because it's the most evenly paced and developed the whole way through. It does the bare minimum in its structure and doesn't have any goofy blasts off to the moon. The seas get degrees kind of book. After that, I was convinced that maybe the last two installments will continue the trend of getting progressively better, if only by a little bit. The previous two found its syrupy sweet legs and grounded its innate goofiness to produce solidly this is a book stories, but I made the cardinal mistake of raising the bar just high enough for Satan to slide on through. God, I can't believe I did that. I'm too old to be making such rookie mistakes. Okay, time for book four. It stars the head of the entire Italian mafia and heroine four, his childhood friend, as well as Goober five's cousin. Gooby's four and five are ultra BFFs and usually act as a unit whenever they're called upon to help out the other saintly dude bros. Heroin 4 grew up a proper mafia princess, therefore she's a bona fide strong independent female girl who has been taught self-defense from her super badass mafia dad so she can totally stand on her own. In theory. Until she's kidnapped by the evil <laughs> Albanians! She's taken around the 40% mark, being to the point where she's bedridden and silly recovering through the rest of the book, rendering her wholly dependent on Goober 4. And I'm getting ahead of myself here. Heroin 4 believes that Goober 4 hates her because he's smoothly evasive around her. Not even prickly or anything, he just comes off as one who chooses not to engage with her. She responds to him by acting a little sassy and passive aggressive, all the while having little internal comments being all like, Oh my god, he's so hot in those sweatpants! Her POV tells us she's a demisexual who avoids relationships since Scuba 4 is the true target of her affection, and she can't get off in bed with strangers, so she just avoids it altogether. And wouldn't you know it, that feeling is mutual! Thing is, he's been preoccupied lately what with rolling up with his homies to quash their adversaries and all. It's a classic misunderstood feelings ex secret mutual pining wombo combo. Heroin 4's birthday is coming up and she wants to celebrate in Vegas, but due to circumstances, Goober 4 is the only person available to accompany her. Cause you know, as head of the Italian mafia, he's got no prior responsibilities or engagements. His calendar's left open in case he's gotta go perform some missionary work with the boys. 
Upon hearing that Heron 4 is stuck with Goober 4 with no buffer, she's like, Oh no, say it isn't so. I hope you won't be a buzzkill, teehee. Then she gets shit-faced and confesses her true feelings to him and is all, I have always loved you. Let's get married. Oh my god, wouldn't that be so funny and exciting? And Gooby 4, completely sober, takes that as his sign from the universe to seize his moment and finally put a ring on it. He can hammer out the consequences later. He's head of the Italian mafia, you know? The next morning, Heroin 4 has the appropriate hungover response to seeing a rock the size of her thumbnail on her ring finger. She's gung-ho on a divorce or an annulment, anything to undo her drunken mistake. When she asks Goober 4 if he remembers what happened last night, he lies, saying he was too drunk, man, like totally not cognizant when he picked out the most expensive ring he could find. For all he knows, he got that blood diamond in the luckiest gotcha machine. Goober 5 pops in like the series is Kramer and says that they need to report this to their parents before they make any decisions going forward. Cause yeah, you know, head of the Italian mafia is still beholden to his mommy and daddy. The parents are predictably upset and claim that she needs to take responsibility for her mistakes and keep the baby, I mean, remain married. Heroin 4 pleads for permission to annul, cause even though she's a strong independent mafia princess girl who can throw a grown man over her shoulders, she too is still beholden to an archaic system and lacks the agency to challenge it any farther than pleading really, really hard. Unfortunately, eyelash batting only goes so far as her father's all like, yeah, no, do you want to make us an even bigger laughing stock? Look at it this way. This union would be good to cement our alliances even further, but just so I don't come off as completely heartless to you, my only child, I propose a compromise. Give this marriage six months and then you may divorce. And heroin four, strong, independent female girl, sees no other options in front of her and caves, but at least she pouts about it. Then in private, Heroin 4 confesses her actual worries to her mom, that she's the one trapped in a loveless marriage of convenience when she actually hopelessly adores Goober 4. Oh, how am I going to survive these six months with this unrequited pining? And the mom's like, nah, we've known Goober 4 all his life. We know he'll treat you right. And hey, since Heroin 4 already loves him, she won't feel compelled to run or rebel or provide any sense of interesting tension with or against him. <sighs> Look, if you couldn't really tell by now, I don't exactly read this subgenre for its groundbreaking feminism. You know, I just always appreciate attempts to shake things off to stave off boredom, you know? I just ask for narratives and relationship dynamics that won't make me pull my hair out or my ass to sleep. That's all I ask. Later, Heroin 4 laments not having the wedding of her dreams or a proper romance and Goober 4 is like, you want romance? I'll give you some romance and kisses the air out of her lungs and like, Jesus damn dude, like all you need to do is hold her hand or something, man. What the hell is this goofy virgin shit? This is why his ass has been perpetually single. He has less than zero game, but since she's avoided relationships too, she thinks this is the dreamiest shit a guy has ever done for her. Nothing says dark gangstery grit than a pair of doofy I can't believe they're not virgins. Two days later, and any semblance of prickly bickering is swatted aside when Gooby 4 returns from a gangstery shootout all like, I don't care that you started your period today, I just survived a badass gun brawl, don't question that. With only one bullet graze, I'm hyped up on adrenaline, so we must sex now. I will finally claim you, Oonga Boonga. Turned on from such a display of sensual atmosphere, she tosses aside the heating pad and my doll and engages sexual mode. He starts getting hot and heavy on her, but she's like, yeah, so like, I don't really feel anything right now because I'm demisexual and I'm immune to period horniness. I need an emotional connection in order to orgasm, even though I've been totally madly in love with you for years. Like, I can't see a doctor about it though, cause ha ha, how am I gonna explain my broken vagina to them? <laughs> Tee hee. And he does not compute this at all. He's all like, okay, um, listen, how about you just relax and trust me, I'll sex you up the right way. And he does. Solving a potential conflict in all of five smutty pages. <laughs> 
Then the kidnapping happens. She's promptly rescued by her dad in Goober 4, spends a few days in the hospital, and I think only a week has passed since the shotgun wedding, just for timeline's sake. He confesses his true feelings to her and apologizes for taking advantage of her drunken whims, but she's like, you really love me? Yay! Weeks pass as she recuperates. They do their most boring Walmart Gomez and Morticia impersonations. Nothing but, I love you. No, I love you, and I'll masturbate in front of you to prove it. For multiple chapters, I actually had to go back and skim through the book again just to double check that nothing absurd happened that I forgot about. No, instead she starts to plan for her dream wedding in between cookie cutter uwu sex scenes. Then Goober 4 runs off with the boys to take out the Albanian mafia group responsible for the kidnapping. Like, don't these five not have more important duties? Are they so bored that they gotta run these menial raids that could have been allocated to lower level lackeys? Jeez, it's like nobody wants to crime anymore. They have that dream wedding around the 80% mark. They go to Italy for their honeymoon. While they're out sampling treats at some market one day, they're thrusted into a surprise, literal last minute thrown together high octane bombastic cheese covered cornbread, where they have their badass Mr. and Mrs. Smith style shooty shooty bang bang moment together. The end. Book 5 focuses on Goober 5, the head of the Russian Mafia, and Heroin 5, who was introduced back in Book 1. Goober 5 has been featured in all the previous installments, along with little status updates on Heroin 5, like how much Heroin 5 hates his guts, that she'll throw anything at him, won't fraternize with his family, and just be an all-around rambunctious captive. How dare her! We flash back to the climax of book one where the boys raid the Sicilian Mafia house. Cooper 5 is clearing out the upper levels when he bursts into Heroin 5's bedroom. He gazes at her almost 18 year old body and is pretty much interested at first sight. He doesn't have it in him to execute her like the rest of the family, out of pity for the only innocent and instead yoinks her as a souvenir. So Goober 5 brings Heroin 5 to his house and he's thinking like, I'm gonna keep her safe here till she turns 18 in a few days. Then she'll be a legal adult who can legally take care of himself and therefore she'll be free to go on her legal way. All she has to do is behave for the next few legal days. And Heroin 5 locks herself in a bathroom to cry as this dingus just took part in her family's massacre. So, like, you know, she's not really wanting to play gracious house guest at the moment. Unfortunately, her display of fragility and innocence makes Goober 5 doubt his resolve. Surely she would be trampled by the cruel world if she were to be carelessly tossed out on her own. She needs more than a few days to gather her bearings and mourn the family that he helped massacre. In the few hours he's had her, he's magically developed a conscience. I know what I'll do. For her own good, I'll keep her till she's 21. And I won't even touch her. Ever. She'll be safe in my care. Wow, what a swell head of the Russian Mafia. I'm so thankful to see such soft consideration in my dark and gritty romance. So, Gooby 5, head of the Russian Mafia, decides the best way to welcome his new roomie, to make her feel welcome at his home, is to channel his inner white suburban housewife and make her a chicken casserole. <laughs> this is such white nonsense, goddamn. But she's still not willing to play the gracious house guest for her dude bro kidnapper. Even when he introduces her to his family, she doesn't have the courtesy to play nice with them. Rude. <laughs> so goofy. On her 18th birthday, he gives her a pretty blue dress and he takes her to Barnes & Noble for a shopping spree. It's here where we learn that Heroin 5 is a connoisseur of fun, dumb, trashy YA books. She breezes right past the Fifty Shades of Grey collection and goes for a Twilight box set, the Divergent series, every Jennifer L. Armentrout book she finds, as well as the Nightworld series? Oh, oh no, no, I have the same trash taste as her. Oh, though, like, the Night World series kind of slaps, so I shan't slander a classic. When she can't find a book from a series, Goober 5 has an employee check the back of the store for her. Oh, how sweet. It's like dream date soft boyfriend shit. She repays his kindness by making a run for it at the first opportunity. She doesn't even make it past a page, mind you, before she's caught. 
Like, yeah, duh. But he's so amused that she's tried. He even tells her he would have been disappointed in her if she didn't try to flee. And then he gifts her with another birthday gift, a puppy. <laughs> Wow, I sure love my dark mafia romances are filled with chicken casseroles, pastel dresses, fluffy ass barns, and noble shopping spree dates, and puppies. <laughs> oh man, I'm gonna need to read something so remarkably unsettling after this as a palate cleanser. Jesus. <laughs> Goober5 has concocted this genius plan to be a soft and fluffy good boy to her for the next three years in hopes of getting Heroin5 to fall in love with him. Because of course he's already in love with her. He got her a puppy for God's sake. That's gotta grant him a few legs up if you know what I mean, right? Cut to two years, 11 months, three weeks, and five days later, and Heroin5 hasn't given Goober5 any forgiveness or affection. Metaphorical balls are on the verge of bursting. But in those last two days, they both crack, confess their feelings, and have enough lovey-dovey sex so that when he does let her go, we're all supposed to feel melancholic about it. He even keeps the dog so they can be sad together. And they are sad for all of like a week, week and a half or something. <laughs> He mopes around his fellow Gooby Goos and their partners. Meanwhile, she moves to New York and gets entangled with the Cosa Nostra? Oh, oh no, book, don't do this. Don't bring the Cosa Nostra into this. You're just gonna make me think about another far superior series. Ugh. This limp dick Nicholas Cosa Nostra reveals that Heroin 5's family was in so much debt to them that they were chased out of the city and like the country and then they had to engage in sex trafficking to increase their income. Now that Heroin 5 has stumbled onto their turf, her family's debt falls upon her. A member of the Cosa Nostra volunteers to pay off the debt in exchange for marrying Heroin 5. This guy smacks around Heroin 5 for extra evil shits and giggles while he's at it, and oh my god, all five of these heroines had had their ass beaten or like sexually assaulted at some point in these books. Why do we have to beat up the heroines like this? Wow. Feminism. <laughs> when Cooper 5 finds out about Heroin 5's predicament, he rounds up his homies for one last huzzah. They crash the wedding right at the I do's and have that last juicy shooty shooty bang bang at the 66% mark. Okay, so the main conflict has been resolved. Now what? Well, the last 80 pages is one substanceless, sex-filled epilogue. Oh. It follows the same overly saccharine formula that book four had. Chapters of, oh, I love you when you come undone for me. He really is my home. I guess I'm truly not alone after all. So they have the dullest happily ever after. Ever. Closing the series out in deflating whimper. Shit, there's not even a last minute bombastic cheese explosion. Instead, Mr. and Mrs. Goober 5 get to go to Bali. God, books four and five didn't even have the courtesy to be over the top goofy like book one. The bar has been crushed by Satan. Y'all don't understand. Sir Maximus Goubert, the fifth, has had such a presence throughout the entire series. He's the group chat's genius hacker GPS tracker man. He's done all the plot progression heavy lifting for those other four incompetent dipshits. His bursting, guns blazing, punch first, think later personality has made him a charismatic standout compared to the rest of the generic alpha dude bro squad. Like I said earlier, these five dude bros have more natural chemistry with each other than they do with their respective partners. Their scenes together are what give these guys a glimmer of character. So to have Cooper 5's story shape out to be as uneventful, shittily paced, mopey fuckfest as this is a stone cold bummer. Like, way to end this series. Boo. There is being soft only around your girl, and there's I relinquish all sense of self for superficial Hallmark Channel levels of sentiment. And damn, does the latter just not do it for me, especially for a subgenre that usually calls for the exact opposite of this. Oh well, it's over now. I can't say I had more fun recounting this series than I did reading it for the first time. 
I, I really lack a sense of humor when it comes to reading shit that should be interpreted as goofy as dumbassness. <laughs> Again, a me problem I should work on in the next year. But I mean, I still somehow eventually got enjoyment that I sought after making this series just worth it enough, so yay! Alright, um, cool. Video, video over now. Um, let's, let's, uh, roll the credits and, oh shit, they've been rolling and I've been dancing the whole time. Oh, oh, um, running out of time here. Uh, thanks, thanks for watching. Like, subscribe if you want. Uh, there's a Patreon if you want. That's, that's cool. Uh, thank you for your support. Oh god, uh, running out of time, running out of time. Uh, uh, okay, next video, we're, we're gonna be romancing a bear. Happy New Year, bitches! Bye!